Welcome to Alaska Weather, a production of Alaska Public Media and the National Weather Service, Alaska Region. Produced and broadcast daily from the studios of KAKM, Alaska Weather provides complete forecasts, public, marine, and aviation for all of Alaska. Alaska Weather is made possible by the following sponsors. The National Weather Service. Good evening, everyone. I'm meteorologist Dave Snyder with the National Weather Service. It's the 4th of October, and as always, we encourage you to stay up to date with your local weather information. You can do that several different ways, the easiest of which is picking up the phone and calling the Alaska Weather Information Line, 1-800-472-0391. You can always find us online as well, 24 hours a day. We're at weather.gov slash Alaska. You can always localize your experience a little bit more by going to weather.gov slash Fairbanks, weather.gov slash Anchorage, or weather.gov slash Juno, or use AAWU for your general aviation weather needs, or APRFC, that's short for the Alaska Pacific River Forecast Center. If you have questions about anything you find online or can't find what you need online, feel free to email me anytime, david.snyder at noaa.gov. I'm happy to help you with anything about this show or anything you find about our weather service. Here's a look at what's going on across the region tonight. We'll start in the east across the Alaska Range and the Deltana and Tananoff Flats region. We're talking about some high wind warnings there. So starting at around the Denali region here, uh, we've got uh, high wind warning. Uh, it goes until about 4 o'clock in the afternoon Thursday. It uh, looks like the south winds could gust as strong as 70 miles per hour. And we expect similar conditions across the eastern Alaska Range, but this warning uh, will expire around 7 o'clock when conditions should begin to ease up just a little bit. For the Deltana and Tanana Flats region, primarily for Delta Junction, we expect uh, winds to gust up to about 70 miles per hour, so it's shaded in yellow for a wind advisory, and conditions should start to ease up after 7 o'clock as well. That's when the advisory will go away. A look out to the west, and you see uh, some areas in southwest in yellow and others in red. We'll start with the red shaded regions. Those are high wind warnings. Uh, for the Yukon Delta, for St. Lawrence Island and the Bering Sea coast there, uh, we expect to see winds gusting up to 60 miles per hour. For St. Lawrence Island and the Bering Sea coast, that'll be more of an easterly flow. For the Yukon Delta region, that's more of a southerly flow. And both of those uh, conditions should start to uh, re uh, ease up a little bit more about 6 o'clock on Thursday morning. Now, as we get out into the Yukon Valley, these are wind advisories, and we expect to see uh, some of those winds up to about 40 miles per hour. But we also have a coastal flood advisory uh, for the areas in the lower Yukon. Uh, because of that, uh, we expect to see uh, some uh, coastal inundation there, uh, not substantial, but enough that you may notice that. We're going to talk about that here in just a minute. We do have another high wind warning out here across the Pribilovs that will start at 1 o'clock in the early morning hours of tonight and overnight into Thursday and last all the way until 1 o'clock in the afternoon where winds could gust out of the west up to 80 miles per hour. Sustained winds are actually going to be in the 45 to 60 mile an hour range. So a lot going on across southwest, mainly due to wind, a little bit of coastal flooding. So let's get the details on that. Water levels uh, will probably rise about two to four feet above the grass line between nine o'clock Thursday and six o'clock in the evening. After that, condition should start to improve. Minor flooding is possible in the low-lying areas from Cape Newenham to Kinnick Bay, uh, including the Kuskokwim Bay region. Uh, rough surf conditions probably will result in some minor beach erosion with those strong westerly winds. So coastal flooding may be likely in this region that we have painted in yellow. After that, uh, looking at some rough surf conditions in Bristol Bay, but the condition shouldn't be the worst in this part of southwest. So again, a lot of wind coming in with this and perhaps some coastal flooding in parts of southwest. So make sure you share that among your communities there so everybody is aware as we head through the rest of the night. Here's a look at the satellite picture and you can see the weather maker that's moving through the bearing now. We were talking about this yesterday, how it wasn't much to look at at all out in the west, but in the next 24 hours it would deepen substantially and that's just what we see on satellite this afternoon. Out ahead of that, a break in the weather across the Gulf and into the uh, south and western interior of Alaska. As one weather maker moves away, we're still getting some rain across parts of southeast. In fact, another one to two inches of rain is possible around the Yakutat region where they've already picked up quite a bit, but not expecting any major 
uh, water impacts from that. So no major flooding issues with that, even though more rain is on the way again tonight. So we'll focus out in the west, and you can see this long trail of clouds stretching in almost in a, a straight line or so. That is impacts from the powerful jet stream overhead. Uh, wind speeds there ranging from 150 to about 180 knots there. You'll see that in the aviation section here coming up in just a few minutes. That's helping to spin up the surface low in a pretty substantial way and giving that the power to drive the, the waves toward southwest and also crank up the wind to those gusts that we're talking about from 60, 70, even 80 miles per hour across some parts of the Bering Sea coast and the islands. Our surface chart tonight, again, some light rain continues in the east. Some pockets of rainfall across south central and the interior eastern uh, sections of Alaska. The main feature then is the 967 millibar low uh, just west of St. Matthew and northwest of the Pribilovs. Cold front sweeping across the Aleutians. Conditions really not too bad out across the central and western chain. Been some stronger gusts today, but by and large, the heavier wind has been around St. Matthew and the Pribilovs today. Uh, the wind's starting to pick up this afternoon across the Yukon Delta and southwest. You'll see periods of rain moving in quickly from the south. And as we get into the overnight hours and early tomorrow morning, showers continue for southeast, pockets of rain for south central, and the wind picking up for the south central and Kodiak Island as well. Uh, up north, areas of freezing rain around uh, Point Barrow eastward into the interior, perhaps uh, at Kasuk and eastward toward Prudhoe Bay and, and Dead Horse. Most likely, most places will be dealing with rain and snow rather than a freezing rain uh, situation, but there will be some concern for that in the morning. And then out west, our lows down to 965 millibars. As the front's moving northward into Norton Sound, again, expect the winds to switch around to more of a westerly direction. And that westerly direction is where the power from the storm will be uh, realized with uh, the Pribilovs again under a high wind warning with gusts up to 80 miles per hour southwest, seeing that push of water move inland a little bit more. So around Kitnuk again, uh, you can expect uh, perhaps the water coming up above the grass line a little bit more. And for southwest, expect that push of water to come in, perhaps not as bad, more of a rough surface condition there. Showers will ease up across the Aleutians as we get into the overnight hours and then by Thursday afternoon the low is starting to fill in. The uh, barometric pressure reading you see here at 972 is going up so we know that storm is beginning to weaken a little bit. And another wave of low pressures crossing the northern Gulf at 989 millibars. This will supply southeast with more rainfall as we get into Thursday afternoon and Thursday night. Up north, precipitation begins to ease up a little bit and break up across the coastal plain, but we still have this very tight pressure gradient out across the central and western bearing. Here are the Pribilovs, here's St. Matthew, and here's southwest, and you can see that tight packing there telling us that there will be a lot of wind moving through this region. So once again, the Pribilovs under a high wind warning until at least 1 o'clock tomorrow afternoon or Thursday, and another wave of showers coming in behind that. As we get into Friday, the weather pattern really starts to break apart a little bit more. We still have the dominant influence of what's left of that low pressure system now in western Canada, and we still have high pressure out across the eastern sections of uh, Russia and Asia, and that's pushing that air across uh, southwest, and it's still in more of a west and northwesterly flow. The tight pressure gradient has moved into the Gulf, so we may have some wind to deal with in southeast and across Shelikov Strait, as well as parts of southwestern Alaska, but the worst conditions for the wind will have subsided somewhat. Up north, we're still watching for pockets of rain and snow there, and a shower should be easing up from west to east as we go. The focus for heavier precipitation will also move into the panhandle as we go into your Friday and Saturday. Let's look at the general weather pattern. Let's take a quick check on the temperatures. As we get into the early morning hours for southeast, mid to upper 40s there, south central, about the same, 44 in Kodiak, Bethel looking at 42. Nome near 40 degrees up around Barrow, lower 30 should do it, and about 40 degrees for areas around uh, Fairbanks and uh, well, places out toward Delta Junction. Mid 40s for Dutch Harbor and Alaska with highs tomorrow in the lower 50s as we get into your Thursday afternoon. Mid 50s for Fairbanks, upper 40s for Nome, and uh, upper 30s around Barrow out toward Prudhoe Bay and Dead Horse. For South Central, expect high temperatures on your Thursday back in the lower to mid 50s with a capital city looking at highs in the lower 50s, perhaps uh, lower 50s for Ketchikan, Craig, and Annette as well. Early morning temperatures on Friday will be a little bit cooler for the Brooks Range. Look at Anaktuvik Pass down to 28 degrees. Fairbanks upper 30, South Central in the lower to mid 40s, Kodiak 46. In southeast, most areas back in the mid 40s to start your Friday morning. Southwest in the lower 40s again with winds easing up just a little bit more. Nome and uh, well, Shishmaref probably upper 30s. St. Lawrence Island and Gamble 38. 
and the Alaska Peninsula back in the mid 40s for your Friday. And by the afternoon, look for uh, continued mild conditions across south central, lower 50s there, upper 40s for most of the interior. Southwest closer to 50 degrees, maybe a hair cooler in the southwest, but uh, the Arctic coast still looking at temperatures just a hair above freezing for your Friday afternoon. And now, aviation weather around Alaska. Flying weather is going to become difficult across the west coast, the Pribilovs, and into Nunavak Island as we head through tonight and into Thursday morning, really throughout a large part of the day across southwestern Alaska, and will increasingly become difficult across parts of the western Gulf and even the northern Gulf as we develop more of a barrier jet on the north side of a strengthening area of low pressure across the Gulf. In the meantime, watch for MVFR sliding into northern parts of southeast, affecting Chilkoot and White Pass, a large part of the south-facing slopes and passes of the Alaska Range. You'll see better flying weather in conditions both for turbulence and visibility, even icing across a large part of the interior. But changes will be coming there across a large part of the west coast with IFR to start around Point Barrow as we get into your morning. By the afternoon, you can see that expanding a little bit more across the north slope. IFR is pushing into a large part of the YK Delta and Bristol Bay. Some improvements in visibility are all the way out to uh, Unalaska, Dutch Harbor, and Nikolsky, and on the Pacific coastline of the Alaska Peninsula. And IFR will increase across the northern uh, half of southeast and into parts around Yakutat and eastern sections of Prince William Sound. We'll still be under mainly MB. Far. As we get into Friday morning, look for improvements again across some parts of South Central. The Kenai Peninsula should see a brief break. MVFR to start for a large part of Southeast and IFR conditions for Chilkoot and White Pass for Friday morning. Conditions improve for visibilities and ceilings across the Bering Sea coast with uh, things going down a little bit more for Nikolsky to Unalaska and Dutch Harbor. And IFR will start to uh, recede a little bit across the YK Delta region and into the upper Kuskokwim and the lower Yukon Valleys. Watch for widespread IFR in the morning to uh, trim back just a little bit across the Chukchi Coast, but IFR will remain in place for Point Barrow all the way east toward Prudhoe Bay, Dead Horse, and Kaktovik. St. Lawrence Island down toward St. Matthew Island and along the outer coast of the YK Delta right through Etolan Strait, Nunavak Island, and around the western end of the Alaska Range with MVFR continuing through Friday afternoon for all of southeast. Here's a look at your pass conditions then for your uh, Thursday, Anaktuvik Pass and Anagan Pass. We expect to see marginal conditions last through the entire day. Lake Clark and Merrill Pass will roll over toward IFR conditions as we go through the day. Look for a start at IFR for Rainy Pass, marginal conditions by the afternoon. Windy Pass expected to start at IFR with some improvements throughout the day. Isabel Pass, we expect to see marginal conditions last through most of your Thursday. Mentasta Pass at this point looks mainly VFR, so watch for some changes there perhaps later in the week. Tanita Pass, we expect to see marginal conditions through most of your Thursday. Portage Pass also looks to be marginal at this time, but it won't take a whole lot of travel eastward to run into IFR, so keep an eye on that. And Chilkoot and White Pass also expected to push over toward IFR as we go through your Thursday with the next band of weather moving in. Here's a look at freezing levels, and you can see the cold air is still laying in wait out across the eastern parts of Russia. There are levels as high as two to 4,000 feet, so not really... A, a whole lot of cold air making its big punch or push southward just yet, but you can see that warm air is also not quite as far north as it once was. Levels between four, six, and 8,000 feet covering up the Alaska Peninsula and the Aleutians and a really tight gradient there. The warm air is really being channeled southward though, slowly and surely as a powerful Pacific jet stream is pushing its way over the Alaska Peninsula, the Aleutians, and Kodiak Island heading for southern sections of southeast, where levels there range from two to four, even 6,000 feet across the panhandle. The interior looking at levels between about two and 4,000 feet for most of the region. Here's a look at icing potential, and a lot of this will be changing and wrapping up as it focuses in on that strengthening area of low pressure across the bearing today. Sliding eastward, the core of that will bring more moisture and potential across a large part of the YK Delta. However, that's going to be pretty high up there for most general aviation, so probably not a significant concern. The greater concerns, of course, will be turbulence and visibility as we go through the next 24 hours. Also, watch for moisture to punch up from the south into the interior, above 8 to about 12,000 feet across the eastern band right now. And uh, icing potential will be, uh, the ceilings will be lowering for that 
uh, as we go through uh, Thursday and into Friday across parts of the Bering Strait Coast and the Chukchi Sea Coast. Here's the jet stream. Remember, we were talking about that powerful punch of air. Look at these wind speeds, 90, 150, even 180 knots, pretty much west to east, driving this weather change across the Bering and helping it to ramp up to higher levels. 9,000 feet, you can see the circulation moving its way into the southern end of Norton Sound and the northern Yukon Delta. Strong winds crossing the... Uh, Alaska Peninsula, 50 to 70 knots there, and a broad south and westerly flow into southeast and into south central. Those winds anywhere from 20 to 40 knots across the interior with high wind potential across the range and strong northerlies working their way into Bristol Bay, 55 to 70 knots there. Turbulence, of course, will be extreme in some cases across southwest with high wind warnings for many. We'll have a look at your marine weather here in just a few minutes. Welcome back to another edition of Alaska Weather Facts. I'm meteorologist Dave Snyder, and joining us once again is Eric Stevens, our good friend from GINA, the Geographic Information Network of Alaska, based up at UAF. And thanks for joining us, Eric. Really appreciate it. Oh, happy to be here, Dave. And we love to hear about all the fascinating developments, and new and old, and how the, we're using the tools here, especially around Alaska. And mm -hmm. I've got to think that, you know, satellite meteorology right now is a, a fascinating time to be involved in. If we go back to the first satellite, uh, Tyros, back in 1960, I think is when we got some of those first pictures, uh, weather and meteorology probably changed that day for a whole lot of people, and it's mm -hmm. still changing today, right? Oh, you know it. Satellite imagery is so important, and it's getting better all the time. Yeah. Of course, never perfect, but especially for us in Alaska, where there are other data sets like radars and mm -hmm. weather balloons are so thinly spread, right. the satellite is the great equalizer because the satellite sees everything. Right. Yeah. Right. We've got one particular um, issue in volcanic ash detection. That's a big deal here. Yeah. You know it. If you fly an airplane into volcanic ash, uh, your jet engine might just fail. And, right. and an airplane without engines is in a world of hurt. Sure. So if there's a volcano that goes off, Satellite imagery is the way to track that plume of ash mm -hmm. and to tell pilots this is where you need to not be right. to avoid this ash plume. And uh, there's a, a phrase out there, what's the difference? What's you know, the what's difference? the difference? Okay. Well, it turns out, what we're going to discuss today, that the difference is everything. There's a technique called channel differencing. Okay. That if you take one piece of the spectrum of what the satellite detects, and a slightly different wavelength of that spectrum, even though those two images might look similar, magical things happen when you subtract one from the other. Huh. And they reveal information that was already there, but it was hard to find until you did that subtraction. That sounds like Nicolas Cage in National Treasure when he's got those fancy glasses <laughs> and he's flipping one up and back and forth. I mean, is this what we're talking about? Look, look. Let's go more highbrow and talk okay. Michelangelo. Oh, so apparently okay. Michelangelo <laughs> made some amazing sculpture yeah. and someone said, Michael, that's amazing. How did you do it? Mm -hmm. And Michelangelo's reply uh, allegedly was, well, you know, in that rock, the statue was already in there. Right. I just scraped away the unnecessary bits. In satellite meteorology, yeah. sometimes there are meteorological features that are in the data, but you can't see it until you combine or difference some of the channels. Okay. And we've got a case, good old uh, Pavlov volcano, right. goes off now and then, Sure. and uh, you can observe directly uh, a picture of the volcano, you know, just take it with your iPhone, yeah. you can see a volcano going erupting. off. Yep. Right, but if you want to get the broad view, we need satellite mm -hmm. to do that. Now, there are a couple of wavelengths that we can look at. Wait. So what's a wavelength? What that's, a wavelength? The, yeah. that's the amount of space between a peak and a valley and another peak uh, in a certain part of the electromagnetic spectrum. We're going to look at 12 micron wavelength wow. and 10.8 micron wavelength. What is a micron? So what's a micron? Yeah, we're getting into the geek department now. <laughs> micron is a unit of length and it is quite tiny. We're looking at what's called long wave uh, wavelengths, okay. but it takes 25,000 of these microns to make an inch. Uh, a Whoa. human blood cell is about five microns across. So when we're talking about 12 micron imagery as allegedly long wave, well, that's relative. Pretty too. short for light. Yeah, yeah. it's other part okay. of the, uh, it's, it's just a, an expression for the, the spectrum there. Okay. So we can look at a, at a 12 micron image, say a satellite image. At 12 microns, we're seeing a heat signature here, really. And, and the way this color enhancement works is the, the yellow and the red stuff is, is high cold clouds down mm -hmm. here over the Gulf of Alaska into south central. And if you were, set, you were asked, where do you find the, uh, 
volcanic ash plume in this image. Hey, where do you find the volcanic plume in this image? Okay. It's hard to do. I'm yeah. not sure I could find it. If you, <laughs> if you were to look at this image and just say, show me the, what, you, what jumps out at you here, I'd say, well, nothing really. Well, let's okay. look. So 12 micron doesn't help us. Okay. Let's look at 10.8 microns. All right. All right, look at that. It's practically the same image. So mm. where's this volcanic ash? Can't find it at 12 microns, can't really see it at, at 10.8, mm -hmm. but when we take, subtract one channel from the other, oh. magically, the huh. plume appears. The color enhancement here yeah. uh, highlights the ash in blue. Wow. The data, the information was already there, but we couldn't find it until we subtracted one channel from another. Very it's, interesting. It's almost magical. Similarly, let's say you're looking for fog up on the north slope. Mm -hmm. It's kind of a foggy neighborhood. Sure. Um, in 11 micron and 3.9 micron, we've got a 3.9 micron image here. Um, it's a big fuzzy blur over Barrow. We, mm -hmm. we can't see where the fog is. But the information is lurking in there waiting for us to, to reveal it. All we have to do is find that difference between the 11 micron and the 3.9, and then this image huh. becomes this image, and the fog bank jumps right out, and you can see it up there at Barrow. Now, every, you got to choose the right tool for the job. Sure. Like they say, you open your right. toolbox, all kinds of stuff in there. Mm -hmm. What do we need for this particular task? If you want to find volcanic ash, we look at 12 and 10.8 micron, find that difference. If you want to find it. fog, we'll look at 11 and 3.9 micron, find that difference. It's great, different tools for different jobs. Of course, there's always caveats and gotchas, but this <laughs> fog procedure, yeah. it only works at night, because when the sun oh. comes up, it, it gets in the way. Um, so oh. every product has its strengths and limitations, and in meteorology, the challenge is using the right tool for the right job, and these are some of those tools. And discovery is still happening, even with meteorology. The weather's been around for a long time, but the yeah. tools that are being developed to understand the meteorology is a fascinating and still very new science. It's, a, it's such a young science. We've come so far. I'm getting old enough now that I can literally <laughs> say that, you know, when I was a boy, we didn't have this kind of thing. Yeah. And, and there's new things happening all the time. New satellites will be launched in coming years that will have better instruments than ever before. It's an exciting time, and this is so helpful for Alaska because satellites mm -hmm. help fill in the gaps between other ways observ of the, observing the weather. Satellites are the great equalizer for Alaska. Yeah, and help so many people stay safe in so many ways every you know day it. up here in the last frontier. Yeah, it's what it's all about, protecting lives and property. Well, cool. thank you so much for joining us again, Eric. We love to hear about this fascinating information, mm -hmm. and uh, boy, it just makes me want to go watch satellite pictures all day. So <laughs> hopefully sure we're inspiring more people to do the same thing, and uh, just be curious. It's a, it's a wonderful thing. Thanks for joining us for another edition of Alaska Weather Facts, and we'll see you next time. And now, marine weather around Alaska. Time now for a quick check of your sea ice edge. You can always get the latest information at weather.gov slash anchorage slash ice. Uh, not a whole lot of growth out here over the main oceans, but along the coastline and especially in between barrier islands, we are seeing some new growth of grease ice. A lot of that seems to be building up in the overnight hours, of course, and then melting away during the day, but surely a sign that winter is on the way. You can always check the very latest again on our website 24 hours a day and find the latest outlooks for the season as well. Here's a look at the weather now in southeast. We know that winds will be coming up, and this is just another wave working through, but do watch for some gustier conditions to develop on your Thursday. Inside of the Clarence Strait, southeasterlies with gusts up to 35 miles per hour, a four-foot sea. There's six-foot seas up around the northern Lynn Canal with a steady wind out of the south up to 30 knots. Uh, notice that the outer coast looking at 25 to as strong as 35 knots as you get up toward Icy Cape and Cape Fairweather and around Yakutat. Gusts there could be out of the south up to 40 knots with 13 foot seas expected in the northern gulf. As we get into Friday, notice the, uh, the stronger surge of winds coming in from the west. The jet stream and a powerful area of surface low pressure will guide a lot of that wind in from the west. And you'll notice the wind switch around across the outer coast to more of a westerly direction, 20 to 30 knots. And seas come up sharply, 17 to 18 foot seas expected there. And in the inside passages, more of a southerly flow for the Stevens Passage area in the Lynn Canal, 20 to 25 with 4 to 5 foot seas there. But westerlies make it into the Clarence Strait, 20 knots with a 4 foot sea there to wrap up the week. Across south central, you'll be looking at stronger winds out across the northern and western Gulf, 35 to 40 knots with 12 to 13 foot seas in the north. Easterlies come in strong to Prince William Sound inside 30 knots with 7 foot sea and southerlies coming up across the Cook Inlet region 5 to 8 foot seas there especially west of the Barrens and southerlies 20 to 30 knots. Across the region on Friday 
I expect the westerly winds to still go strong across the region. 16 to 17 foot seas, 30 to 40 knots there. Northwesterlies die off inside of Prince William Sound. Seas down to 2 feet. And 4 to 12 foot seas across Cook Inlet with the worst of the weather just west of the Barrens going in at 40 knots and 12 foot seas expected for Friday. Across the Alaska Peninsula and inside Bristol Bay, strong winds will affect the region. Again, the coastal areas may see some uh, small coastal flooding issues there, so check for the latest conditions as we talked about it earlier in the show. Uh, southwesterlies inside of Bristol Bay up to 45 knots, 20 foot seas there, 26 foot seas down the Bering Sea coast with a 45 knot wind. And look for 35 to 40 knot winds across the Pacific coast, uh, just east and south of Kodiak Island, 35 knots with a 13 foot sea. For Friday, winds diminish and the seas start to go down a little bit more across the Bering Sea coast, 35 to 40 knots with winds out of the west. Still looking at seas though at 18 to 19 feet, and you'll see seas across the Pacific coast from 17 to 19 feet with the strongest winds moving into the western gulf and just south of Kodiak Island. For the Aleutians, again, strong winds uh, through the central and eastern chain, most notably to your north toward the Pribilovs, 35 to 40 knot winds there and seas up to 20 to 24 feet for Thursday afternoon. The Pacific Coast looking at 15 to 17 foot seas. Winds out of the west and southwest for the western chain, uh, 14 foot seas there on a 30 knot wind. As we get into Friday, conditions improving for all areas. A west and southwesterly flow, most regions 15 to 20 knots. And across the Bering Sea coast, you're looking at 9 to 15 foot seas and 9 to 10 foot seas there across the Pacific coastline for the central and eastern chain. Across the west coast, this is the area of most concern with strong westerly winds. Again, we do expect some minor, minor coastal flooding issues there, especially around Kipnik, as we talked about. High wind warnings for the land and for the Priblops. Gusts there could reach 70 to 80 miles per hour. A 55 knot wind sustained with 31 foot seas across the Priblops and south and westerly flow on either side of Nunavak Island. Winds will be a little bit lighter up to the north around the Bering Sea coast and Norton Sound. Southeasterlies inside of Norton Sound, 25 knots and diminishing as we get into Friday with westerlies also tailing off. But south of Nunavak Island for Friday, we may still have a strong westerly push and seas hold to 13 to 18 feet as we get into Friday. Across the north, winds will be a little stronger across Thursday for the Chukchi coast, 15 to 35 knots across the region, and lighter winds up across the Beaufort Sea coast, but still blustery, six to seven foot seas there, and for Friday, winds switch around to a west and northwesterly direction. Look for five to six foot seas in the Beaufort and northerlies developing across the Chukchi coast, 20 to 25. A quick recap of tonight's weather shows a powerful low moving through the central Bering Sea at 965 millibars. High wind warnings are posted for many parts of west and southwestern Alaska, as well as the eastern Alaska range. There will be opportunities for some coastal flooding around the Kipnook area. Make sure you check the latest conditions in your area by calling the Alaska Weather Information Line or checking at weather.gov slash Alaska. As we get into Thursday, low pressure moves inland, spreading more rain and wind across the west coast and more rain into parts of southeastern Alaska as well. By Friday, conditions should be improving in all areas and rain will still be working across the central and eastern Gulf. Thanks for watching Alaska Weather. We'll see you right here again tomorrow. These forecasts are to be used for planning purposes only. Call 1-800-WX-BRIEF for a formal pre-flight briefing. Always file a flight plan before you go flying. The U.S. Coast Guard Auxiliary urges you to leave a float plan with a friend or the harbor master before you go boating. Alaska Weather is made possible by the following sponsors. The National Weather Service.